Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts. I have a brief bulletin for you folks today and an unfortunate one, especially given the timing. The day after I roll out good news about a breakthrough in the field of nuclear thermal propulsion, another announcement was made indicating that the entire project known as Draco is going to be put on hold for reasons that appear to have been completely avoidable. The first problem is the fact that Lockheed Martin and DARPA, together with General Atomics, who have been assigned the responsibility of building this engine, do not have a proper test facility for carrying out ground tests of a nuclear thermal engine similar to the test that took place half a century ago, the last time that NASA was working on this project. And perhaps more significantly, there are new regulations in place when we're talking about radiation and nuclear reactors that are going to make these tests much, much more difficult to carry out than was the case in the 1960s and early 1970s. This has put the entire project on indefinite hold. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. For the first time in a while, I'm going to go ahead and embark on a good old-fashioned angry astronaut rant, because all of the things that have caused this delay were completely avoidable, and something needs to be done about it if we ever want to have practical nuclear propulsion for space flight, which, in my opinion, is going to be an absolute necessity if we want to carry out a safe and successful journey to Mars and back anytime in the near future. And the reason I believe this are reasons that I laid out in my previous video. Utilizing chemical engines, there's no way to get to Mars and back on a single tank of gas, so to speak. You need to manufacture hundreds of tons of in-situ propellant on Mars in order to carry out the return trip. The technology to do something like that is at least five to ten years away and probably more because we're talking about introducing full-fledged ice mining on the surface of Mars, mining hundreds of tons of ice and then converting that ice into usable propellant while also using the saboteur method in order to create hundreds of tons of methane. All of that would take enormous facilities, which would require many, many starships to deploy. Whereas nuclear propulsion could get an expedition to Mars and back on a single tank of fuel. So what's the problem? What's come up right now to put this project into jeopardy? Well, I'm gonna be quoting extensively from a recent article released by Aviation Week. And here we go, quote, a vision to accelerate US access to cislunar space and the wider solar system through a landmark demonstration of nuclear thermal propulsion technology must wait. The 2027 launch date for the demonstration rocket for agile cislunar operations, or DRACO, is on indefinite hold. Since initiating the program's design phase two years ago, the DARPA NASA management team has encountered the challenges inherent in sending a nuclear reactor into space for the first time in more than than 60 years. Although keep in mind that nuclear thermal propulsion was undergoing extremely mature tests in the early 1970s. It is frustrating to think how close we were to having a practical nuclear propulsion system half a century ago and how far we are now. The team, including at BWX Technologies and Lockheed Martin, hit snags in designing an engine that can be ground tested safely while adhering to the protocols necessary to test a nuclear reactor. According to Matthew Sambora, one of the two Draco program managers, quote, we're bringing two things together, space mission assurance and nuclear safety, and there's a fair amount of complexity. 
DARPA and NASA awarded a contract to BWXT and Lockheed Martin in July of 2023 for Draco Phases 2 and 3. BWXT was in charge of designing and building the reactor, manufacturing the fuel, and delivering the complete subsystem. Lockheed would integrate the reactor with an engine and a demonstrator space vehicle ahead of on-orbit tests scheduled for 2027. That team is now focused primarily on developing and delivering the Draco engine and associated reactor. And as such, according to Sambora, quote, 2027 is not a date we're shooting for at this point, stressing that an eventual on-orbit demonstration remains the primary goal of the program. The engine would consist of a one meter long, ultra high temperature, high assay, low enriched uranium fueled flow through nuclear reactor. <laughs> That's complicated. Let me try to explain that. It's a reactor that burns extremely hot, but for safety reasons, such as an anomaly on their way to orbit, such as what we saw with Starship not very long ago, it utilizes low enriched uranium, which reduces the amount amount of radioactive materials that would be scattered across the Earth's surface in the event of an anomaly on the way to space. The fission reaction is harnessed to generate heat to energize a helium gas propellant which is exhausted to produce thrust. A follow-on operational engine would replace helium with more energetic liquid hydrogen fuel. The Draco team has not signed off on a design for the reactor. Quote, we are considering ourselves still pre-completed PDR. That stands for Preliminary Design Review. By the way, Lunar Starship is not at PDR either. But in any event, while the reactor is at a PDR level of maturity, DARPA says that it is examining design refinements meant to improve ground processing safety and enhance on-orbit data collection. Lockheed Martin and BWXT plan to perform a cold flow test of the reactor this year. Lockheed Martin Space's Vice President of Lunar Exploration Campaigns tells Aviation Week, expressing support for DARPA's approach to focus resources on engine development. But the U.S. has not launched a reactor since the 1960s, an era euphemistically referred to as the time before safety was invented. Scientists in the Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Applications Program, known as NERVA back then, conducted six ground tests of radioactive reactors in open air between 1964 and 1969, quote, which we would never get approved to do today, according to Jim Schumacher, DARPA's second Draco program manager. A Draco ground test would need to capture plume exhaust fully to ensure no radioactive materials are released to the environment, but the U.S. does not possess this type of engine test capability. And... <laughs> Incidentally, this kind of engine test capability was not required in the early 1970s, where radiation was released into a variety of different test facilities on a pretty regular basis because the United States was also exploding nuclear weapons in the same area, which produced far more radiation than any nuclear engine ever did. According to Ramon Osorio, a spokesperson at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, cost of effective approaches are being explored for a single event, short duration engine test comparable to what the Draco effort would require, but Osario says that, quote, qualifying an operational nuclear thermal propulsion engine for space transportation will require a ground test capability that accommodates full duration engine operations with additional facility support to disassemble the engine for an engineering assessment of the internal hardware post test. By the way, these were facilities that existed 50 years ago, and it is difficult for me to understand why NASA never determined that they were going to need these facilities again if they wanted to bring this engine to maturity quickly. As it explores potential means of testing the engine, the Draco team is working to maximize ground-based component and subsystem testing that can be done with existing capabilities, a subset of which will take place at Marshall 
International Space Flight Center. Even after the demonstration, Draco's challenges will not be behind it. Long-term storage of cryogenic hydrogen for the follow-on propulsion system remains a key challenge for the scientific community. However, Blue Origin has been working on long-term hydrogen storage for quite some time, and we don't know how far they've gotten with that process, but their current objective is to have something like that ready for service by the end of this decade, given the fact that they have Artemis obligations that would involve the long-term storage of hydrogen. However, here's the big problem. For the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the US and Europe are not alone in their pursuit of space nuclear propulsion. Six years ago, China launched a program to develop a megawatt-class, ultra-small, liquid metal-cooled space nuclear reactor. Component-level testing verified the feasibility for an experimental prototype Chinese reactor, which is based on a highly enriched uranium fuel. The Chinese are a lot less concerned about scattering radioactive fuel across the planet in the event of some sort of launch anomaly. So here's what annoys the hell out of me. Number one, NASA definitely knew that they needed ambitious test facilities in order to bring an engine like this to maturity. And number two, NASA is now operating under new environmental restrictions. Well, restrictions that have been in place for decades, but nevertheless, they weren't in place the last time they were trying to develop an engine like this that's going to make it very, very difficult for them to complete their work. Let's go ahead and see how much radiation was actually released into the environment when there were no restrictions at all. In March of 1966, the NRX EST or Engine System Test of the early NERVA nuclear thermal engines was brought into operation for 116 minutes. The next engine had multiple startups between May and June of 1966 with 30.75 minutes accumulative operating time at or above one gigawatt worth of power. The next reactor was tested in December of 1969 and ran for 62 minutes. Each engine had post-test examination and found various structural anomalies that were identified for correction and fuel element corrosion rate was reduced and the test continued. The only full-fledged prototype engine that was built and tested until the summer of 1972 Two had 28 startups and ran for 90 minutes. So we're talking lots and lots of tests with a considerable amount of sustained operations over a period of 10 years. And the total radiation that was released over that entire time frame, according to a 1995 study, was 843,000 curies, curies being a unit of radioactive contamination. Granted, that's a fair amount, but but by way of comparison, a one kiloton tactical nuclear explosion, in other words, approximately 5% of the Nagasaki explosion generates over 30 million curies. What that means is, for these tests to produce as much radioactive contamination as just the Nagasaki explosion, which by the way is nothing compared to quite a number of the nuclear tests that the United States carried out over decades and decades, for these tests to generate the same amount of radiation as a Nagasaki explosion, they would have to run for 7,000 years. And by the way, the DARPA testing will not need to run anything near as long as the Nerva tests had to run back in the 60s and 70s. So the question is, do we really need modern regulations to apply to such limited testing for an engine that's going to bring such incredible benefit to spaceflight? Engines that for the most part will be tested in space once they have a few tests on the ground. In my opinion, the U.S. government needs to green light a test facility for these 
these engines with relaxed regulations for a temporary period of time until the engines can be made operational. I don't want to minimize the danger of radiation, nor am I saying that this is the sort of thing that should stay in place forever, just for a couple of years until the engines can be brought to maturity, because the need to capture all of the plume exhaust completely is creating a massive engineering challenge that really need not be there. These engines are not going to operate on Earth. These engines are not going to be spewing radioactive waste into Earth's environment on a regular basis. We are only going to be testing them temporarily until they can be tested in space. And given the fact that the United States carried out 1,054 nuclear bomb tests, all of which released far more radiation than any nuclear engine test will, I think we can bend the rules just once for something that's going to be so constructive as opposed to weapons that were so destructive over so many years. Are you listening, Elon Musk? Are you listening, President Trump? Because you've said that getting rid of regulation is an important priority for your administration, and this is a regulation that I think, at least temporarily, we can do without. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and also please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. All the details are in the description, and until next time, stay angry about space.